Hi, everybody, and welcome to another session on revision for our A-level exams in 2017. In this session, we're going to think about some of the policy options for tackling climate change. All of them have, if you like, the long-term aim of decarbonisation, of decoupling the link between economic growth and carbon emissions. In 2015, the Earth's surface temperature was around 0.9 Celsius degrees warmer than the 20th century average, and uh, therefore... The, the need, the, the drive for effective climate change policies to cut emissions has never been greater. The good news from a UK perspective is that carbon emissions in, are in long-term decline. Uh, UK emissions, CO2 emissions uh, of greenhouse gases stood at 514 million tonnes of CO2, equivalent in 2014. Clearly the recession uh, caused a big fall in emissions in 2009, but actually, there have been similarly large falls in 2011 and 2014, uh, much of which has come from a, a decline in emissions from industry and power generation, those kind of heavy carbon sectors. Another, another bit of good news is that emissions from cars in the UK are falling quite substantially, as you can see here, in terms of CO2 emissions per kilometre travelled. In part, this is the result of tougher, more stringent regulations on carbon emissions from new vehicles brought in by the European Union. And another bit of good news ahead of uh, it's all doom and gloom is that new investment in clean energy worldwide over the last uh, 10, 11 years has, has shot up. It really has climbed very significantly. Yes, there was the dip in 20, 2012 and 2013, but it seems to be rising again towards $300 billion a year. And uh, in world renewable energy consumption in the world has grown substantially, increasing the supply of energy from renewable resources is, is mainly motivated by the macro aim of achieving more environmentally sustainable growth. But from a UK perspective, as well as many other countries, another long-term aim of this is to increase output from renewables to diversify energy supply and, for example, make the UK less reliant on imported oil, coal and gas. Crucial point is, I suppose, as, as renewable energy be, grows it sufficiently, becomes large, it should be able to exploit economies of scale, and therefore bring down the unit cost of energy for consumers. And that, of course, is linked to a more equitable distribution of income and wealth. So there are lots of strategies that can be used to cut emissions. Here are four key ones. Carbon trading, carbon taxes. We'll look at those two in this session. Tougher emissions regulations for industry and uh, things like new homes. And also on the positive side, things like subsidies and tax breaks to try and encourage renewables. OK, so let's look at some of the some of the main ways of uh, trying to cut emissions. Most economists believe that to cut emissions effectively and sustainably, you need to put a price on carbon in some shape or form. And carbon pricing, either through emissions trading or a carbon tax, is becoming more common in a number of countries, as this graphic from the World Bank shows. Indeed, here are some examples of interventions to put a price on carbon in different countries. Sweden was the first country to introduce a CO2 tax in 1991. At the time, it's over 25 years ago now, the price was just €29 Euros per tonne. But it's since risen to today's price of €137 Euros per tonne. Now that is the highest CO2 tax rate in the world. Uh, you know, 12 years ago, the European Union Emissions Trading Scheme started. Britain is part of that. It's had a, a rather checkered history, as we'll see in a few minutes. China this year is launching an emissions cap and trade system. Chile, or Chile, uh, is aiming next year to fully implement a, a climate pollution tax. South Korea introduced emissions trading two years ago. Iceland has just announced its intention to double, albeit from a low level, its existing carbon tax. And Singapore hopes to introduce one in the next two years. Slight reversal in the trend is that Australia repealed their carbon tax in 2014. So let's look at emissions trading. Uh, the European Union Emissions Trading Scheme is, is shortened to EU ETS. And it's a cap and trade scheme for carbon dioxide. Okay? It's actually central to the European Union's climate change target of, of cutting emissions by, by 40% by 2030 compared to 2005 levels. So the EU trading scheme uh, covers 45% uh, of the EU's greenhouse gas emissions, mainly from the, the big energy incentive intensive sectors such as electricity uh, and uh, heavy industry. Essentially what the trading scheme does is it sets a decreasing cap for CO2 from those key industries and then allocates or auctions increasingly emissions allowances or permits which can be traded on the open market. 
Now, if you're a business such as an airline that's part of the European trading scheme, you need to buy enough carbon emissions allowances or permits to be able to trade. The higher the price, the greater the incentive to cut pollution. So in simple supply and demand terms, here, here's how it works. There is, in, in, in essence, an equilibrium price for the carbon permit. Each permit equals one tonne of CO2 emissions. And if you gradually lower the cap, then the supply curve of permits shifts to the left. That increases the scarcity of carbon permits, which causes an increase in the price, for example, from 10 euros to 20 euros. Now, if the carbon price is high, for example, a power generator, electricity company might decide to shift some of their capital investment towards renewable projects because this will have a lower carbon impact and they won't need as many carbon permits. Smaller businesses, if the carbon price is high, might also switch to, for example, maybe small-scale wind or solar schemes to lower the expense of them having to buy carbon permits in the EU market. The crucial point about carbon trading is that carbon trading is a quantity adjustment to the volume of CO2. So gradually you lower the cap to bring down with more certainty the total volume of pollution. However, the chart here is, is recognition of some of the problems that the system has had. The price of carbon allowances under EU ETS is priced in euros. And as you can see, it's been volatile. But actually, for many years now, the price has been below 10 euros per tonne. The main problem is not just the volatility, but the extremely low price. And basically, when you get a low price, the incentives to use renewable energies are pretty weak. Indeed, some power companies have gone back to burning imported coal because it's cheaper to do that. A fall in the uh, carbon price also means you get less revenue from the auctions of permits. The European Union is aware of this problem. They think there's a structural excess supply of carbon permits in the system. And it's trying to reduce the supply to, to bring the price back up. But for the moment, the European Union carbon price is just not high enough to really drive the incentive to, to cut emissions. One of the results of this has been that the UK government, not alone, but, but prominent, has introduced a carbon price floor. So this is effectively a minimum price for carbon emissions. And the government introduced it under the previous coalition as a way of trying to reinforce the incentive for, for companies to internalise the externalities and cut their emissions. So from 2014, the government announced a price floor for carbon of £18 a tonne of CO2 that's going to last until the end of 2020. Some UK businesses have been against this. Well, the case for a carbon price floor is that the certainty of knowing what the carbon price is <laughs> reduces the risk, pardon me, <coughs> reduces the risk for businesses to invest in low carbon technology because they know what the price is going to be in the next three or four years. It, clears, it sends a clear signal to polluters because you know it. It's going to have to be 18 minimum 18 euros per tonne. And in theory, it should make low carbon electricity more competitive. So, for example, uh, companies like uh, Drax in, in South Yorkshire switching their investment towards biomass and other forms of, of electricity generation. The case against the price floor is that actually the price floor doesn't really fundamentally change the situation. It's far better to be tougher on the amount of carbon permits available that would drive the price up. A carbon tax for many people is, is regarded as a better alternative and probably creates more revenues. And crucially at the micro level, some UK businesses, particularly the steel sector, for example, have complained that they having a carbon price floor of 18 euros per tonne, 18 pounds per tonne, sorry, makes them less competitive, for example, against cheaper steel from China or Poland. Poland is inside the EU ETS. One of the things which is, is happening, which is, I think, which is worth noting before we look at the carbon tax, is there has been an increase in employment in renewable energies. So this is the latest data for 2016. And uh, if you add all this, these numbers up together, solar, photovoltaic, wind energy, etc., biofuels and, and what have you, approximately 110,000 people work in the renewable energy sector in the UK. Now, that is you know, clearly far less than once worked in mining. Uh, but the, you know, a rising number of people now work directly in renewable energies. And crucially, of course, there are lots of other jobs linked to the renewable energy energy, for example, in manufacturing, designing, installing and maintaining wind turbines, for example, or biomass plants. So as we shift towards renewables, there should be 
an increase in employment, the key evaluation point, I suppose, is whether that's going to be a fairly labour-intensive sector, employing lots of extra people with positive multiple effects, or was it going to be largely a capital-intensive industry with relatively few jobs created? The other main alternative to carbon trading is a carbon tax. So, a carbon tax is a tax on pollution, tax on CO2. Effectively, you're putting a price on carbon by taxing the polluter. Here's our classic externalities diagram where there is a, an external cost of production. The marginal social cost just lies above the marginal private cost. So the optimal level of production is probably Q1, where social and private social benefit and social cost come together, whereas the private optimum output is Q2, private cost and private benefit. So there's a deadweight loss of welfare resulting from the negative externality caused by, for example, CO2 emissions. Now, in this case, there is a first order argument for saying that you should tax the polluter, make the polluter pay. Now, the tax on carbon, as we see in this uh, altered diagram, increases the private cost of carbon, increases the MPC, and in theory, this causes output to contract towards the social option, which is Q1. But the key point, of course, is the carbon tax raises revenue for the government. And that revenue is shown by this area here, tax per unit multiplied by output. So what are the arguments for having a carbon tax? Well, a pollution tax basically is, a, is the classic way of internalising the externality, making the polluter pay for the externalities they cause. A, a carbon tax is actually relatively easy to administer. And from a business point of view, if it's imposed, the tax is predictable. If you're a consumer as well, you know that you pay whatever, another 5, 10 p a gallon of petrol or whatever it is because there's a carbon tax applied. Businesses that emit carbon wouldn't know there's a tax on carbon. A carbon fee on imported products, often it's the case that people complain if you put a carbon tax in on a domestic producer, uh, they suffer. Well, you could also impose a carbon fee on imported products. Goods and services coming in where there's a carbon content. That would help reduce the risk of domestic businesses maybe relocating out of a country to a nation where carbon taxes are lower or non-existent. Crucially, a carbon tax does generate revenue. And that tax money, and here's a phrase which is quite important, can either can be earmarked or sometimes known as hypothecated for other uses. So, for example, you can raise, raise money by taxing carbon and use some of the money for research in clean energy. Or you could try and make the carbon tax revenue neutral. So the extra revenue you get from the carbon tax could be offset to an equal amount by maybe a tax cut on jobs to improve employment, or maybe a subsidy of childcare, or perhaps as a pure tax rebate to a lower income family. Indeed, for example, if everybody, if there was a carbon tax which allowed the government to, let's say, offer, for the sake of argument, a £500 tax rebate to all families, £500 to a low income family would be worth more in relative terms than £500 to a family on £100,000 a year. So you can make a case for saying that a tax rebate using, drawing on the revenues from a carbon tax, would be a progressive form of taxation. However, there are counter-arguments, as we know, to evaluate these things, and uh, here are some of the, the counter-points. First of all, there's a debate about whether a carbon tax actually changes behaviour significantly. It depends on the price elasticity of demand. And indeed, you may have to impose a very high carbon tax to really drive behaviour. If you put a carbon tax on energy intensive sectors such as mining and oil and gas, you may cause some structural unemployment as those sectors decline. And they won't necessarily find work in renewable sectors. There's also a risk that the burden of a new high carbon tax, if it leads to higher prices in the shops, would actually fall more heavily on low income families, possibly regressive. And, you know, similar to the carbon price floor, if one country imposes a carbon tax, then there's a risk that their domestic producers become less competitive compared to countries with perhaps less commitment to an environmental intervention. The key thing, the key thing in terms of final evaluation is to really, really ask the question, is a, is a carbon tax effective in reducing emissions of greenhouse gases and therefore mitigating climate change? Effectiveness of a tax is important. The other question is whether a carbon tax can be revenue neutral. So you're taxing a bad pollution, but with offsetting tax reductions in, in other areas. 
when we think about the various policies, most economists favour the instrument of a carbon tax over tradable permits. I think that's probably the case across the profession. Most economists favour a carbon tax. However, the barrier is that public support for carbon taxes generally are pretty low. Uh, people tend not to believe that they're environmentally efficient and they tend not to believe that the revenues will be used for good public pur purposes. They fear that the revenues will find their way into other, other hands and not, not lead to social benefits. So persuading people that the carbon tax is the way ahead is probably more than half the battle.